All right. We are ready. Um, just adjusting my screen a little bit. So today we're going to talk about growing the vine crops. And there's always a little bit of confusion about what actually is a vine. Because um, people talk about tomato vines, which are actually true vines. And talk about sweet potato vines, which are true vines. But we're not talking about sweet potatoes. We did that last time. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, we had a workshop on tomatoes, peppers, and sweet potatoes that's available online. But today we're going to be talking about the vine crops that are members of the cucurbit family. Uh, last time we were talking about members of the tomato family. Before that, we were talking about the members of the cabbage family, because they group vegetables by the different family groupings and they have similar characteristics. The cucurbit family includes. Um, hang on here. So think of cucumbers, squash, pumpkins, all the different melons, musk melons, cantaloupe, watermelons. There's some exotic melons, some Asian melons, and of course gourds. And then there's just some miscellaneous things that don't fit into any category. Uh, these are all different cucurbits. Um, as a group, they're pretty complicated. Uh, just the naming of them, the common names and the botanical names get confusing sometimes. And there's just so many different varieties. If you've even just looked at like a local pumpkin patch or even your local grocery store, when they're starting to sell pumpkins and squash, there's all different kinds for sale. So there's just many, many different kinds. <coughs> there's also some difficulty growing the cucurbits because there's some insect pests, which are pretty challenging, uh, especially with squash. We'll talk about them. And then there's also some plant diseases, especially with the, the melons, the the cantaloupes and the watermelons that could be challenging also. But we'll talk about all those things here in a little bit. A little bit about the botany. Um, they are fruiting plants. So whether or not it's a cucumber or a squash or a watermelon, those are all fruits. And they all come from flowers which have been pollinated. And the interesting thing about the cucurbit family is that the male and female flowers are separate. They're different. Um, sometimes like on some plants, the male and female flowers are together in one flower, but here they're separate. Um, and so you can see here in the picture on the right, these are some squash flowers. The one on the left is a male flower. The one on the right is a female flower. And you can see that because you can see actually the immature little squash here that hasn't started forming yet, or it's just starting to form. And then once that gets pollinated, the flower will drop off and that will get bigger. So what actually has to happen is the bees or bumblebees, honeybees, bumblebees, there's some also some other pollinators that will do it, will take pollen from the male flower and bring it to the female flower. And then that starts that fruit developing. Over here in the picture on the left, you can see a little cucumber flower. That's a female cucumber flower because you can actually see the miniature cucumber there while the flower is still attached. <coughs> Excuse me, a little bit of cough, I'm still getting over here. Um, so they are annual vines. Um, they are insect pollinated, which means that they need bees to do this. They won't be pollinated by the wind. Um, they're also sensitive to frost. Uh, as soon as it starts getting cold and we start having frost in the fall or we have early frost, you know, or having frost in the spring, they do not do well. They will not tolerate that. So, and then also sometimes natural hybridizing can occur. Um, crosses between different kinds of squash, different kinds of pumpkins will happen. And sometimes that can mess you up, especially if you're trying to save seeds. Um, so we'll talk about some more of that here in a bit. Um, there we go. Growing conditions for cucurbits. Like most vegetables, they prefer full sun. You want good soil. And they do like the warm temperatures like we were talking about. So ideal temperatures in the 80s for daytimes are perfect. Um, that really is what helps the, like the melons and the squash all develop. Um, nighttime temperatures, minimum 60 degrees. And so usually that's not a problem in the summer. This sounds like your average summer temperatures. That's why they grow well during the summers. But in the fall, when maybe your watermelons are still trying to ripen, Sometimes it gets cool and things take too long and they don't, don't ripen completely. 
as far as ideal soil conditions, they do prefer deep soils. Um, oftentimes, the places where they grow them commercially will be like along the rivers and you know good river bottom soils. Uh, they do need good drainage though. Um, can't have standing water, and lots of times for melons, especially watermelons, cantaloupes, they do like what they call sandy loam. Around here, we don't really have sandy loam. We have clay loam, uh, but that's better than just clay. It's, it's hard to grow them in just clay. They do not do well. They need at least a good loamy soil, even though there's some clay in there too. Slightly acid pH is preferable, but they will tolerate higher pH than that. High organic matter is very helpful. You want a good rich garden soil with lots of organic matter, just like you do for almost everything else. And they do have high potassium and phosphorus requirements compared to some crops. And magnesium is kind of important too. So those are all the things you think about. If someday, if you're having problems growing watermelon, you might, or some of the other cucurbits, you might actually get a soil test and see where your potassium and phosphorus and magnesium are at. For some reason, my thing keeps going the wrong direction. All right, timing. Uh, you know, just like we were talking about with tomato plants, timing is everything. You don't want to plant too soon. Uh, generally, you're planting from seeds, and you want to wait till the danger of frost has passed and the soil has warmed up adequately. But usually, I think around May 1st um, is good. If it's not warm enough then, the nights are still too cool, the seeds probably just won't sprout. So it's not a big deal. Um, want the warm soil. Some people will actually go to the trouble of warming their soil ahead of time where they're going to plant their melons and cucumbers and squash. And you can do that by um, putting plastic over the soil. Uh, clear plastic will do it. Some people use black plastic. Either one will warm up that soil. If the weather is warm in late April, like it's been lately, you can actually plant a little bit early. You're planting your seeds. Um, especially squash, you know, like zucchini and yellow squash, they're a little more tolerant compared to the melons. Um, you can also start plants indoors in jiffy pellets. Um, and let me explain a little bit about jiffy pellets here. Um, hang on a second, I'm trying to adjust my thing here. That's my coughing break. Jiffy pellets are little. Um, compressed things of, of pot, potting soil that you can use to start seeds in. And the reason they work good for the melon crops and the cucumbers and squash is because the roots don't get wound up like they do in a plastic pot. If you try to grow one of these vining crops in a plastic pot, they do not do well. Um, so jiffy pellets are definitely the way to go um, because the roots will just grow out straight and will make the transition. But you don't want to start them too soon if you're starting your ones indoors, usually about April 14th, or even you could plant them right now and then just plant them out when the weather's good. Um, usually about two or three weeks in the pots and they're in the jiffy pellets and they're ready to go. Um, as far as just planting the cucurbits, things to remember, just like all your other vegetable crops, you want to rotate your crops, put them in different places each year. Don't plant your vining crops in the same place each year, just because of insects and disease build up. Uh, warming the soil, we just talked about. Um, some people like to plant in hills. And if you look here, you can see what that looks like. Um, and all hill is, sometimes people make the hills too tall and they make it pointy. It really should be a flat hill, a flat mound. What I like to do is make them for melons, so I don't know, 15 inches across, and then level off the top and actually make kind of a basin in there. You can see how the top of this uh, little mound is scooped out so that it will catch the water. And then I'll put like five seeds in there and poke them into the sides. And I'll even put a little bit of mulch over the top, just a little bit to keep it moist, and then you water it. Um, you don't want to plant your seeds too deep. Um, whatever the instructions are, cucumbers and cantaloupes, usually about a quarter inch. Watermelons and squash, usually about half an inch. Um, give them the proper spacing. And then if all those, all those seeds germinate, you're going to remove um, all but two. So if you plant like five in there and they all germinate, pull out three of them because that'll be too crowded if you keep them in there and just leave two. 
Um, and again, starting indoors, if you're gonna do that under lights, using the Jiffy pellets, but whatever you do, do not buy plants from a greenhouse of cucumber, squash, cantaloupe, watermelon, pumpkins, because they just do not do well in plastic pots and they will get stunted and they won't grow very fast. The seeds that you plant outside will grow faster than if you buy plants somewhere. As far as watering in the summer, just like your average vegetable crops, you're going to give it an inch to an inch and a half of water per week. Um, and you're going to water, I prefer <coughs> excuse me, watering in the late morning or early afternoon, um, just because you don't want to have water on the leaves at night, because sometimes that'll lead to mildew. And then also I recommend mulching just to reduce evaporation. As I do with all your other vegetable crops, you want to mulch that will keep the soil cooler, it will stop your plants from drying out, keep the soil softer, will help the microorganisms. There's just a whole bunch of different reasons why mulching is a good idea. All right. Um, oops, there we go. Fertilizing. Um, they don't need a lot of fertilizer. As we mentioned, um, the pH, if your pH is way too high, you can make the soil more acid by adding sulfur, <coughs> excuse me. Um, also phosphorus and potassium, watch the levels on that. Um, you don't wanna have a lot of nitrogen. That's why I discourage people from adding too much fertilizer because what happens is you'll get lots of green growth from your vines, your watermelon vines, your cantaloupes, your squash, but you won't get very much fruit. So you don't wanna to add too much fertilizer. As far as weed control, just like in the vegetable garden, um, all the other things you're growing there, you can cultivate around with your hoe or you can use a tiller in between the rows. Um, but with the vining crops, the roots are fairly shallow. So you have to be careful if you're using a hoe, you have to be careful you're using a rotor tiller because you don't wanna go deeply and tear into the roots of your vine crops, which are gonna be spreading out pretty far. So much better solution would be to use mulch like in this picture here, you see a nice straw mulch around some cucumbers. Um, that's a, the best way to go. Um, you can also use grass clippings from your lawn if you don't get your grass sprayed for chemicals treatment. Um, some people will also use landscape fabric or weed, weed blocker mat, weed mat. Um, it lets water through. It's not the same as just black plastic. It is made out of plastic, but it, it's perforated, so it lets water through. Um, here, they're doing it with some squash. It definitely keeps weeds out. Um, you just have to cut a little hole where you're gonna plant your seeds. Sometimes people do this for their melons also. So that can be another option. But definitely mulching or the weed fabric is a good, good way to control the weeds. All right, let's talk a little bit about some specific crops, the cucumbers. Um, and I get a lot of questions about slicing cucumbers and pickling cucumbers. And so the slicers, you know, are just the ones that get bigger and longer. The ones you see in the grocery store. Sometimes they're skinnier, sometimes they're fatter, but they definitely get longer. When they're ripe, they'll get, you know, anywhere between eight, 10, 12 inches, as opposed to the pickling cucumbers, which are shorter, the ones on the right here. They're usually like three inches, four inches, maybe five inches. What happens is sometimes people get confused and they, plant pickling cucumbers and they wait for them to get bigger. And so they'll wait and wait. And eventually what happens is they get overripe because they don't get bigger. Um, but here's the other interesting thing. You can use pickling cucumbers just like a slicer in a salad when they're small, um, just slice them up, they're fine. Don't let them get overripe. They're, they're fine for using in a salad. So you can use them as a slicer. And just like the opposite, you can actually take your slicing cucumbers and you can make pickles out of them. But typically because they're so big, you would not make them out of a whole cucumber. Whereas like the pickling cucumbers, people sometimes will actually do whole cucumbers and put them in the jars like you get from the store and you know they'll fill up the jar. But like these big guys on the left here would not fit into a jar. So if you're gonna use those for pickles, you can slice them up. So um, it's really a question of, of purpose and size. 
The other question I get lots of times is when to harvest. People say my, my cucumbers are turning yellow or they're turning white. Does that mean they're ready to harvest? And no, that actually means they are overripe. You want them to be a nice dark green. Uh, these are the same, some of these are the same pictures from the previous slide, but you look at the slicers on the left, they're a nice dark green. If you let them stay on the vine too long, they will get yellow and they will not be good. Uh, the seeds will get bigger. The flavor will not be good. They'll get bitter. Um, even these little um, pickling cucumbers, some of these are getting a little overripe. See how they're getting a light color? They're getting that yellow color. Really, the dark green with the stripes is the normal color you want for those. You definitely do not want to let them turn either this bright yellow or they get a little older, they're brown. Sometimes, depending on the variety, they'll turn white. Those are not right. But this one here on the left is good stage. I mean, actually, these ones are overripe. Um, and so you don't want to let them get overripe. And there are some other types of cucumbers. There's what they call gherkins. Um, and true gherkins are actually different than your regular cucumbers. They have spiny little bumps all over them. They're kind of weird looking like that. Lots of times they'll just call small cucumbers that in the pickle, they'll call them gherkins, but that's just a nickname. The true gherkin is this different type of cucumber. Again, it's very spiny, has lots of bumps, doesn't get very large, it's kind of oval shaped. And then there's this thing they call the Armenian cucumber. You'll see that in some of the catalogs. Um, it's actually pretty good, but the interesting thing about it, it's actually more closely related to cantaloupe than it is to cucumber. Um, it's very similar. Um, the flowers, the shape of the leaves, um, the shape of the fruit actually is more like a cantaloupe. I say the shape, but the, the texture of the fruit. But when you cut it open, it's like a pickle. And some people really like them. They get really long. Um, and so something to try, just a little bit different if you're growing pickles or growing cucumbers for pickles. And then there is also um, some other ones. There is some Asian cucumbers that get very long and skinny. <clears throat> this one here is a variety that we have, <clears throat> excuse me, which is very long, slender, called Suyo Long. And then you'll see this in the catalog. Lots of times it's kind of a gimmicky thing. It's a round cucumber and it's called lemon. And people get excited about it because they talk about it having the, the flavor of the lemon. It looks like a lemon. <clears throat> if you look at the cross section, it looks a little like a lemon. But what this is, it's just a round cucumber that is overripe. You're not actually supposed to let them turn yellow to eat them. Because what's going to happen is the flavor will get bad, the, they'll get bitter, um, the seeds will get large. See how many seeds are in there? It's almost all seeds. So it's really not a good cucumber. Um, it's one of those gimmicky things. People think it's interesting because it looks like a little lemon, but I do not recommend it. As far as planting, um, you can plant them in hills. Some people just like to plant them in a row. Um, it doesn't really matter. You just need to make sure they have enough space. But the important thing is trellising. Um, they do need something to climb on. You can grow them flat on the ground and they will grow. Um, they take up a lot more space. Um, the other thing is the long cucumbers will sometimes get curved shape. If you want nice straight cucumbers, you let them grow on the trellis and they'll hang down and grow straight like that. Um, you know, you can do something fancy like this with the strings and this frame that they built. That to me is a lot of work. I just like using wire fencing. We use cattle panels, um, but it definitely is a better way to grow your cucumbers. Also makes them easier to find because you can just look on that trellis and see where they're at. Whereas if they're growing on the ground, just spreading out, you know, like a melon or something, it's hard to see where the cucumbers are at and you'll miss a lot of them. <clears throat> as far as pollination for cucumbers, um, bees are important. Like all these um, vining crops, they all are dependent on bees. Honeybees and, and bumblebees are the main ones. Again, they have the male and female flowers. There are some special types of cucumbers that you will see in the catalog. And they're interesting, and you might want to try them sometime. Um, this first one is called Parthenocarpic cucumbers. It's a long word. What that means is they can grow fruit without being pollinated. 
I know it sounds strange. There's only a few varieties that are able to do this. Um, it's mostly cucumbers. There's a few squash that do it. Um, but the advantage is if you have really bad problems with bugs, what some people will do is they'll grow their cucumbers under row cover and cover them up, keep out the cucumber beetles. Um, and then they'll still form fruits inside because they form them parthenocarpically. And I don't understand how the parthenocarpically thing works. How do they develop fruits without being pollinated? It's complicated, but just suffice it to say that there are some varieties that will do that. Um, the other thing that you'll see sometimes in the catalog, they'll talk about um, uh, gynecious. Um, that's the second term. It looks difficult. I actually had to learn, look up to see how to pronounce it, uh, gynecious. And what that means is um, there's more female flowers than male flowers. Uh, the average cucumber is what they call monoecious, which means about half the flowers are male and half are female. That's kind of normal. Um, but in a gynecious uh, cucumber variety, more of them, like at least 70 or 80 percent, sometimes almost 100 percent, will be um, what they call um, just the female flowers. So what that means is you get a lot more cucumbers. So some people like to grow those just to get more and more cucumbers. Um, usually, if you're growing cucumbers and they're healthy and they're not having problems with bugs or diseases, you get more cucumbers than you need anyhow. So again, something interesting. You'll see some of the varieties. Those seed varieties are usually pretty expensive uh, just because it's difficult to produce them. As far as insects that attract cucumbers, the, the big one is the cucumber beetle. Um, there's a couple different kinds. The one on the top is what they call the spotted cucumber beetle. It looks kind of like a green ladybug. It feeds on other plants besides um, cucumbers. Um, it likes squash. It likes the flowers of many kinds of plants. If you're a flower gardener, it will chew holes in your flower petals. Um, it also, um, it goes through a different life cycle. And when it's a larva in the ground, um, it actually feeds on the roots of corn plants. If you've ever heard people talk about the corn root worm, that's actually the larva of this beetle here. If you have a garden, you're going to have cucumber beetles at some point. Um, they're difficult to control. There's some organic insecticides that work pretty good. You can put row cover over your plants to screen them out, um, but at some point you need to get them pollinated. Um, the other bad thing about the cucumber beetles is they can spread disease. There's some bacterial wilts that they will pick up, and as they fly around, they'll carry that with them and spread it to other plants. That's why it's good to try to control them if you have a whole lot of them. The one on the bottom is the striped cucumber beetle. You don't actually see that one around here as much. Typically, you're more likely to see the spotted one up above. And like I said, it looks like a sort of green ladybug, but it's, and it's distantly related to the ladybugs, but definitely not a good insect. Here's that bacterial wilt disease I was talking about. Um, sometimes you'll come out, you'll look at your Cucumber plant that also affects um, cantaloupe because they're similar, they're closely related. And this bacterial wilt is spread by cucumber beetles and leafhoppers and some other things. And there's really no cure for it. Um, it just happens, you'll come out and then your whole plant will just be all wilting and dying and drying up. And it's very sad. Um, you can protect them using row cover because that will screen out the cucumber beetles. But at some point, you need to take the row cover off generally to let them get pollinated. But that can help uh, protect them for a long time. <clears throat> All right, so that's cucumbers. Now we're going to talk about muskmelon and cantaloupes. Um, you know, a lot of people are confused, and it is confusing. Generally, when people talk about muskmelon, that would be the one up on top. Um, you see how it has this netting um, with the ridges like that. That's typical of a musk melon. And whereas the one in the bottom is not, does not have those ridges, does not have the netting. Um, and that would be called the cantaloupe. Um, now to make things even more confusing, there's a, something else they call a true cantaloupe, which you never even see in the store hardly ever. So 
But when you see cantaloupes in the store, they're talking about these ones on the bottom here, and those are typically called Western cantaloupes, whereas the musk melons are grown more on the Eastern half of the United States. And that's these kind here. Musk melons tend to get larger, um, heavier. Uh, the, the cantaloupes are smaller and um, that's usually what you'll see in the grocery store will be the cantaloupes. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, other melons, of course, are honeydew. Uh, they're green fleshed, very sweet. Uh, there's a cassava. That's another one you don't see around here very often because it has a long growing season. You'll see it sometime at the farmer's markets. Uh, the Crenshaw is actually one of my favorite melons. The inside of it is like a, a cantaloupe, but it just gets very, very sweet. I bought a few down at the city market. They take a long time to grow, longer than cantaloupe and musk melons. Um, but typically they come in from California or someplace. But there's some varieties that you can try around here. Uh, but they're very good. You should try one sometime. And then there's a bunch of different kinds of Asian melons. Um, typically they're white fleshed or green fleshed. Um, sometimes they're smaller, almost like the size of a small pumpkin um, or like the size of a grapefruit or something like that. And they're just different. If you want to try something different, there's just a million different kinds of melons out there. Oops, I did it again. As far as harvesting, um, there's some different types. Um, they talk about harvesting when, it's, when the melon slips. Uh, and so like, Typically, uh, the musk melons, when they are ripe, you can pull on the stem and it'll just separate nicely and easily. But a lot of the melons, particularly the cantaloupes, they don't slip. And so you just have to wait till they're ripe and know when they're ripe. So the, the, the other indicators besides the slipping thing um, would be fragrance. I don't know if you've ever been in the store and seen you know, and you can, without cutting into it, you can smell it. And it says a strong cantaloupe smell, fragrance that is pleasing. Um, that's generally a sign that it's right. Um, the other thing is color change. If you look at the picture here, you see that two of them are, are still green, but this one here that's turning yellow, um, that's a sign of ripeness. And that yellow, turning yellow, the light color, doesn't happen all at once. So as you're watching them in the garden, they'll, they'll start from the green and gradually get to that yellow, and um, and they'll be you know um, ripe. So as you harvest them, you'll get a sense of when is the right stage. So don't feel bad if like you pick one and it's not ready yet. Uh, then the next one you just want to let it go longer. If you pick one and it's not ready yet, most likely it will not ripen off the vine. They'll ripen a little bit, but they don't get much sweeter. So it, if it uh, is not sweet, um, just don't waste your time on it. Uh, but once you get experience, you'll be picking them at the right stage. You just want to let them get really, really ripe. Because generally, the, the riper they get without getting mushy um, is the sweeter they'll get and the better the flavor. As far as the insect and disease control, remember that talking about the cucumber beetle, um, must smell and cantaloupe are plagued by cucumber beetles as well. And they will spread that bacterial wilt. That's why sometimes what people do is they will grow them under row cover as long as you can until they start ready to produce the fruits. And then they'll take the row cover off so that the bees can get in there. Here you can see some uh, cantaloupe plants growing under some row cover. All right, watermelons. Um, watermelons are one of the most challenging things to grow. Um, they do like deep soil. They like lots of room. They have a long growing season. There's many different types, many different sizes. Just looking at this picture here, you can see a whole bunch of different kinds. Um, some of them are oblong, some of them are round, some are dark green, some are striped. Um, there's small ones, there's big ones. I would say the smaller ones are easier to grow because they don't take as long to ripen. Um, if you're going to get a 25, 30 pound watermelon, I've grown them. And I've had some really good ones, uh, but they take longer to ripen. And sometimes if you're dealing with the cucumber beetles, you know, it's, it's a problem keeping the plants healthy until the, the melons, you know, get ripe. Um, so that's why if you have a shorter 
season variety, the smaller melons, um, you have a better chance of getting some watermelon. The other thing is, um, you know, it was fun growing those large 30 pound watermelons, but they don't really fit in your refrigerator very well. Um, so it's, you almost like have to have an extra refrigerator to cool them down if you like to eat the watermelon cold. Um, I prefer a smaller, what they call an ice box size melon, more of like a football size. Um, you know, if you're gonna have a big family event, sure, get a big melon and you know, you'll have lots of watermelon for everybody. But um, if it's just yourself, smaller family, the smaller varieties work great. Um, the ones I also like a lot, if you've ever had yellow watermelon, um, it's usually very, very good, crisp. Uh, if you pick it at the right stage, we offer one variety here at the Kansas City Community Gardens, the Japanese yellow fruited watermelon called uh, Yellow Doll. And it is one of the best tasting watermelons I've ever had. Um, it's really good. So anyhow, lots of different watermelons to try. Again, watermelons are bee pollinated, male and female flowers. Look at the one on the top. That's the male flower, the one on the bottom. Is, you'll see these out in the field. That's actually a female. And that's where the watermelon is going to develop right there. Once it gets pollinated, that will start to grow and get bigger. I get a lot of questions about seedless watermelons because people like them at the store. So here's what I know. First of all, they're not truly seedless. Um, depending on the weather conditions, they will have little tiny seeds that are immature. And here you can see pictures of them. They aren't black and hard. Um, they're soft. This is actually a little bigger than they are normally. Usually they're smaller because Seedless watermelons, it's not that they don't have seeds, it's just that the seeds don't develop. They don't get large, they don't get hard. Um, so they're usually soft and small and you hardly even see them. They're, they're very small, you don't see them. You just eat them and you're not realizing that you're eating the seeds. Um, so these you can see are a little bigger on this one, but it is a seedless, considered a seedless watermelon. And you would typically eat those and not try and spit them out because you wouldn't hardly taste them. Um, the seeds for seedless watermelons are expensive to produce. So basically they're having to make a hybrid where they take two different kinds of melons, cross them, and then they harvest the seeds from that. And then that gives you a variety that doesn't produce seeds. Um, so this have to do that all by hand. So it's kind of expensive. So the seeds are gonna cost you more. You also need really good conditions for germinating the seeds of seedless watermelons. It has to be warm enough, um, so don't plant them too early. And you also do need a pollinator variety because um, they don't pollinate themselves. That's part of the being seedless thing. You have to plant another kind of watermelon that isn't seedless uh, just to get your, your seedless ones to pollinate. So typically what you'll do is people will plant like seven vines of the seedless type. And then the, the eighth vine will be a regular watermelon, a pollinator type that will provide pollinators, pollination. The bees will go visit those male flowers and carry pollen over to the female flowers, um, the seedless variety. So it sounds a little complicated, but it works. So the other really big question I get is harvesting watermelons. It's just difficult if you haven't done it before. Uh, not that it's physically difficult, although they can be heavy, it's more of a, a question of knowing when they are ready. So as you grow them, you'll get experience. You'll become better at it as you go along. Um, some of it will be size. You'll know like how big the watermelon is supposed to get. Um, if your variety is supposed to be a, a 10 pound watermelon, you can actually take a little scale out and put, you know, carefully lift the watermelon to sit on the scale and it's getting close to 10 pounds, you know it's getting close. If you're growing like a, a crimson sweet or a, a Verona, something like that, um, black diamond, they get really large. It might be like a 30 pound watermelon. You're growing out, out there and weighing it and it's only 15 pounds, you know it's not even close. So that just lets you know that you have to wait longer. But as far as picking a watermelon when you're ready to pick it and knowing that it's right, um, obviously size will be a factor, but also the yellow spot um, is an important factor. 
you'll look underneath, kind of roll it over without trying to break it off. And you'll see if it's ripe, you'll see a yellow spot, like the one up here on the upper right. This helps you when you're at the store, if you're trying to pick out a good ripe watermelon, it will be yellow as opposed to green. Or the in-between stage would be white. That, that spot will be white. That's just where it's been sitting on the ground. You know, it's been sitting there long enough and that melon's starting to ripen. Uh, you'll see a nice yellow spot. Um, <coughs> the other thing is um, there's a tendril because they are vines. The tendril is that little curly Q thing we saw at the beginning on the cucumber vine. And that's how vines will climb. We, we generally don't let our watermelons climb up a trellis because the fruit would be too heavy and would break the, the, the vine off. Um, so generally watermelons, we just grow them on the ground. Um, but at every leaf joint, wherever there's a leaf, uh, there'll be a tendril. And that's that little thing with the curly cue for climbing. Um, and if you go and look at the one where the watermelon's attached, like this one right here, this one's turning brown. Um, but if you go back one farther towards where the plant is coming from, it takes a while to figure out which way the plant is growing. But farther back towards where the vine started, and go back one more, <coughs> excuse me, and you look at that tendril. Uh, so when that one is turning brown, that is a sign that that uh, watermelon is ready. That plus the yellow spot. Um, those are your best indicators and we'll let you know when that is, um, when it's ready. So um, look for the yellow spot, look for the brown tendril farther up the vine. Some people will talk about coring a watermelon, which means you take just a little sample out of it to see if it's ripe. Um, I tried that and yeah, it'll tell you if it's ripe, but it's not much good if it's not ripe. It's not like you can put that core back in there. I tried it once. And all that did was introduce some bacteria to inside the melon and the melon just rotted from the inside. Once you open that melon, it's like opening a can of something. It would need to be refrigerated. Uh, otherwise, it will start to go bad. You just let it grow in the field. The other thing, people talk about thumping watermelons. Um, and I get it. That can help you know if a watermelon's ripe. If you thump on it and it has kind of a hollow sound, um, I'll do this when I go to the grocery store, I'll thump them, try to hear that hollow sound, um, makes a nice thump when you do it. And that is usually a good indicator of ripeness. Um, can also be indicator that it's too ripe, um, but anyhow. But you know, if you try different watermelons in your garden, try thumping on them. And when you finally do find one that's ripe and you cut it open, try thumping on it and you'll hear the different sound as opposed to one that's not ripe. Um, so that can be something else that can be helpful, but it's not quite as uh, the scientific of an indicator as the tendril or the yellow spot. Oops, did it again. Um, squash and pumpkins. Uh, there's many different kinds. They can be very confusing. Um, to make it even more confusing, there are some squash which are actually the same plant botanically as a pumpkin. Like a yellow regular pumpkin is called Cucurbita pipo. That's its scientific name. And that is the same name for um, zucchini squash. And so you can actually, if you plant a zucchini squash and a pumpkin right next to each other, and you save the seeds from that zucchini, or you save the seeds from that pumpkin, next year you might actually have something that would be a cross in between the two which probably would be neither one you would want. You don't really want a pumpkin that looks green and never turns orange. Um, you probably don't want a zucchini squash that has really hard flesh like a pumpkin and isn't as good and tender for eating. So um, that's how they make crosses between different things and getting new varieties. But anyhow, so, but let's for just categorizing sake, Let's group them into summer squash, winter squash, and pumpkins. All right, so pumpkins, um, a lot of people think they're just ornamental, but you can also eat pumpkins, especially some kinds of better than others. Um, summer squash doesn't refer to 
just the season when they're growing, because obviously you're going to grow them in the summer. Uh, but winter squash, you also grow those in the summer. So we'll talk about that in a little bit here. But let's talk about the really bad pests that bother squash plants. Uh, there's two of them, and one of them is the squash bug. Um, it's in the group of bugs called the, the stink bugs. You see how it's got this flat uh, shape. It's sort of shaped like a shield. That's a, a stink bug member. Uh, when you crush it, it has a very stinky taste. The taste. I hope that people don't taste it. Very stinky smell to it when you crush it. Um, but what they do is they have this little mouth part that pierces into your fruit and sucks juice from it and damages your fruit. So very, very bad pest. Um, they lay eggs underneath the leaves of pumpkins and squash. So see the little brown eggs attached. And these are the little babies that hatch out. Um, they're called nymphs. And at this point, they're pretty easy to kill. Um, they're soft bodied. You can actually spray them with an organic insecticide at this stage and it will kill them. The stage at the right, when they have this hard shell, they are difficult to spray with organic insecticides. It won't have much effect. Um, what some people will do with the adults is go out and catch them or catch them in a trap. Um, there's different ways to do that. <coughs> um, but really, the best thing to do is try to pick off the eggs when you see them. Um, and I talk about this more in my insect class, which will be coming up in June. Uh, so you can also look at the one from last year online if you want to, um, as far as helping to control that. But this is a major pest and causes big problems for people. The other one is the squash vine borer. And this is a, a type of moth that almost looks like, like kind of a little yellow jacket or a wasp. It's kind of rust colored. Here's a picture of it. You almost don't see it very often because it flies around so fast. Here it is getting some pollen from a, from a flower. Um, but what they do is they lay eggs on their squash and their pumpkin on the stalk. And because they're members of the moth and butterfly group, they um, lay their eggs and the little eggs that hatch turn into little tiny caterpillars and they actually bore into the stalk of your squash plant or your pumpkin plant. And while they're inside, they're eating that from the inside out and they're getting bigger. And eventually your whole plant will just collapse. If you've ever had that happen with your zucchini plant, your yellow squash, or your pumpkin, you come out and it's just collapsed overnight. I'm 99% sure that was a vine borer that did that. It's been inside feeding for quite a while. We just didn't know it was there. You'll read in books and it'll tell you things like, oh, you can take a, a coat hanger, a piece of wire and stick it in there and try and move it around and squash that little thing. But that is not very effective. And usually by that point, it's too late. Um, so there's different ways to control it. Um, there's some organic insecticides. Uh, one interesting way is to actually inject the organic insecticide into the stalk and that will kill the little things that are inside. Um, so um, that's something that we talk about in the insect class as well. But anyhow, it's very, very bad pest of squash and pumpkins and can be really frustrating for people. All right, as far as the different kinds, um, summer squash, what that is, it's a type of squash that you're gonna pick when it's immature, it's not fully ripe, I mean, it's ready to eat, but as far as like the seeds ripening, the, the shell is not hard, um, they're soft enough, they're tender. And so they're cook, good for cooking. So think of like the zucchini, uh, green squash. Uh, lots of times people think zucchini is a separate vegetable from squash. It's really just a type of summer squash, just like the yellow um, crook neck one here in the middle down here is um, a yellow squash, that's a summer squash. Also, the little one that looks like a little flying saucer, that's called a patty pan squash. Um, and that's good to eat when it's tender also. The key with all of these is picking them while they're young and while they're tender. Sometimes people will come and say, oh, I, I've got a great big zucchini in my garden that's two feet long and weighs 20 pounds. Well, the problem is that's not going to be great eating. The, the shell is going to be hard. 
you'll have to peel that off. <coughs> People talk about making zucchini bread with it, but it's a waste of time in my estimation. Um, it's better to pick your squash while they're small and tender. Um, think of like for the zucchini or the yellow ones, like six inches, eight inches at the most. Um, you don't want to let them get big. The little patty pan squash, I pick them like two and a half inches across, maybe three inches. Um, if you let them get hard enough to where you can't penetrate the skin easily with your thumbnail or your fingernail, then they're too um, too hard and overripe. Um, I've seen people grow the yellow squash and let it get overripe and it gets all these big bumps on it. And they say, well, can I eat that? Nope, it's terrible at that stage. People use them for decorative, like a gourd, you know, for you know, Thanksgiving decoration mainly. But the yellow ones, you want to eat them while the skin is very nice and soft and yellow and really very small. Um, sometimes even in the store, they'll be like four inches long, and that is one of the best stages for eating. So there's also some round ones. There's a zucchini one called eight ball. It's just a round shape like that, kind of a gimmicky thing too. And there's other summer squash. There's some that they call the kusa. It's a Middle Eastern Mediterranean squash that's kind of a light green in color. And there's also some zucchinis that are yellow in color as opposed to green. So there's lots of different varieties out there. Um, but yellow squash, summer squash, zucchini squash are one of my favorite vegetables. And the ones that you grow yourself are gonna be so much better. Winter squash, on the other hand, instead of picking it when it's immature, you wanna let it be mature and let it get a hard shell. Um, because then it will keep for a long time. So again, it's not going to grow over the winter. It's called winter squash because you can store it over the winter, much like you would a sweet potato or something. And if you pick it at the right stage, it'll keep for several months. Um, it's a little bit harder to grow because the longer growing season means more time for the squash bugs, more time for the squash vine borers to attack it. Um, but if you grow them and grow them successfully, you'll have something that you can eat in the winter and they're very healthy, they're high in vitamin A. Um, the way that you'll know when they're ready is you can do that thumbnail test and try and see if you can penetrate that skin. Um, and if you can't penetrate it, generally that's a sign that it's, it's getting, you know, right when the shell is hard enough and it's ready to pick. Um, again, there's many different kinds. Um, this one here is a butternut squash. They start out kind of lime green and then they get kind of stripy like that there. That's not right. And then they get this kind of what they call butternut tan colored. Um, and that's when they're ready. So um, just the different kinds. Uh, besides the butternut squash, the acorn squash, there is the spaghetti squash. That's a yellow one. Uh, and that when this, the flesh of that one, when you um, cook it, it's sort of stringy. Some people use it as a pasta substitute for like spaghetti sauce. And you can do that. Uh, I think it's a good vegetable just by itself. Uh, it's not really the perfect replacement for pasta. I still like pasta, but it's a great vegetable for eating. Uh, there's an, another kind called delicata. Um, and that's like this one here with the nice stripes on that. We're gonna be offering some delicata squash seeds for the first time here at Community Gardens this year. Um, and that, from the reports that I've had, is one of the best tasting winter squash ever. Just very sweet, really fine texture, fine flavor. So might want to look at trying that. And that brings us to pumpkins. Um, again, many of the pumpkins in this country are grown just for jack-o'-lanterns you know, autumn decorations, and that's fine. Um, some of them are actually good to eat. The smaller ones, which are actually a variety of what they call the pie pumpkin or the sugar pumpkin, the flesh on it is higher in sugar, which makes it better, natural sugar, makes it better for making into pies or if you're cooking up other things with pumpkin. Uh, cooking your own pumpkin is a rewarding experience as opposed to just getting it out of the can. Um, Again, the problem with pumpkins is that squash vine borer and the squash bug, just like with the squash plants. 
they make it really challenging because it takes, you know, generally 90 to 100 days, 110 days to get a good pumpkin. Uh, you have to really work to protect them from those insects during that period, but it's worth it. Um, as again, as I was saying, a lot of pumpkins in this country are just for decoration. Uh, you'll see all these interesting ones at the grocery store, sometimes what they call cheese pumpkins. I think I got another picture here of some different kinds. Yeah, there's a bunch of different kinds um, at, at a county fair type thing. Um, some of them we call blue pumpkins, cheese pumpkins. Um, Cinderella pumpkins, all different kinds. Um, and a lot of them are really fine for cooking and eating. Um, I do know in Australia, I had a friend who was from Australia years ago, and she um, said in their country, they eat pumpkins a lot. She said sometimes on a farm, you might eat pumpkin almost every day. Um, that's how often they use it. They would just cook it like you cook a winter squash and you know, salt, better salt, butter, pepper, all that kind of stuff. Um, and just eat it or you can can it. Of course, you can make it into um, pies. Some people will make cookies and cake out of pumpkin. So lots, lots of great uses, even pumpkin soups, all kinds of things. And there are some varieties of pumpkin that have seeds that do not have a hull or the hull is very thin and it makes it great for eating like the snack. If you buy pumpkin seeds at the health food store that either have been shelled or are the hullest kind. Um, you could toast them and make a great snack, very high in protein. Um, so yet another reason for growing pumpkins. Um, one thing about timing though, uh, let me go back here a little bit. It's interesting, if you plant a pumpkin May 1st, uh, most of the varieties are like 90 to 100 days. So it means May, June, July, and then about August 15th, you know, maybe 1st of September, you will have um, pumpkins ready to harvest. Now, if you're trying specifically to grow pumpkins for Halloween or for fall decorations, that's way too early and they won't necessarily keep that long. I mean, they may keep that long, but generally, you know, people like to go out and buy their pumpkins about October 15th, you know, maybe a couple of weeks before Halloween and they'll keep for a while, you know, um, sometimes several months. But in the summer, if you're picking them August 15th, they won't be ready, uh, won't be in good shape, you know, when Halloween rolls around. So if you're planting for then, I recommend people plant them later, not May 1st, but more like June 10th, June 15th. Even sometimes I've seen people plant them July 1st for the smaller varieties. Uh, but somewhere around June, middle of June is good, and that will get your pumpkins ready in time for Halloween, and they'll last for a long time, and that will be more what people are looking for. All right, here's a couple other miscellaneous uh, cucurbits. One is the loofah gourd. Um, if you're familiar with the loofah sponges that you see, um, sometimes you'll buy them at the store. Um, people use them like a sort of like a scrubby pad. You can use them for scrubbing dishes. Um, it's good for exfoliating your skin or whatever. Um, so you have to harvest these at the right time. They're easy to grow. They grow on a trellis, um, have nice yellow flowers. Um, and interestingly enough, when they're small, and when I say small, I mean like small zucchini size, like six inches, seven inches, and maybe an inch in diameter. Uh, they're actually edible and they're very good. They're very popular Asian vegetable uh, to be eaten at that stage. Once they get large like this for the loofah gourd, um, for the sponge, um, obviously they're very spongy inside and fibrous and aren't great for eating. Um, also, if you're gonna do the loofah gourd thing, you need to study and read about proper stage for harvesting. You don't want to let them totally dry out, but you don't want to pick them too early. Um, another one is the bitter gourd. It's a popular Asian uh, vegetable. Um, sometimes there's one called the bitter melon. They're pretty similar. They're really more of a, a gourd type thing, but they're really in their own group. And um, the seeds can be poisonous, so you got to be careful there. And they're bitter. It's kind of an acquired taste, but uh, popular vegetable Asian cuisine. 
And then there is the Itali edible Italian gourd, um, which is actually more closely related to some of the gourds where people use them for craft projects to let them dry out. You ever seen like a snake gourd? This is more closely related to that. Um, but again, at the small stage, they're edible, um, can be cooked, um, like you might use a zucchini or something like that. And um, just another type of gourd that you can eat. And then here's a fun little cucurbit plant. This is called the mouse melon. Um, and it's because when it's full size, the person holding those in the hand, that's full size. And it looks like a miniature little watermelon that maybe a mouse would have. Because you think like, you know, the watermelons with the green stripes on them, that's what it looks like, but it's just a little tiny miniature thing. And the flavor of this thing is not sweet. So it's not sweet like a melon. It's more like a little cucumber. And you can pick that thing and pop that into your mouth and just eat the whole thing. You can cut it and slice it if you want, put it in a salad. It's kind of fun. Kids seem to think they're great. I think they're great. Uh, you can see what grows on a little vine. So, you know, nice to have a trellis to hold it up, um, but easy to grow, very undemanding. You don't want to grow it near other um, vining things like um, winter squash or watermelons or something that will overgrow it because the vine is not as strong and sturdy as some of those other vines. And then the group of gourds, the birdhouse gourds, the bottle gourds, um, there's other shapes too. There's one called the bushel gourd. Again, those snake gourds. Um, some of them they make into musical instruments. Some of them they'll make into little bowls and utensils. There's the dipper gourd. This is all a special group of plants. And they um, actually grow all over the world in tropical areas. Um, they figure that some of them floated from continent to continent because they, when they hollow out, they are dry and they will float. Um, so at the end of the season, uh, if they got ripe enough and developed long enough, um, this thing will just let it sit outside. Some people will put it out in the cold garage and it will just slowly, slowly dry out from the inside out and eventually become hollow. And you can make a birdhouse out of it. You can make different gourds, uh, projects, we also have some at the community gardens um, called the dipper gourd, not sorry, not the dipper gourd, the spinning gourd. And it's like a little miniature top. Uh, we'll have them available at a fall family festival in September. You can paint them for little projects, but also it's just a, like a fun little toy that you can spin like a top. Um, all right, so a little bit about the community gardens. That's enough about the cucurbits. Uh, let me just say a little bit, and then we'll check to see if we have any questions. But um, if you haven't heard about the Kansas City Community Gardens, we are a membership organization, and you can join and become a member, and your membership price is based on your income. If you qualify for a low-income membership, it's $2. If you're not, there's a $12 membership, there's a, a $25 membership. Uh, but with your membership, you get 10 packages of seeds, and then you can also buy plants at a discount. You can buy additional packages of seeds. You get a 10 pound bag of fertilizer with the membership. So it's a great deal regardless of what category you're in. And we just try to have lots of great seed varieties and plant varieties that will help people grow their gardens. And we have lots of educational resources. If you haven't had a chance, check out our website. Um, you can see all the different seeds and plants we'll have available. Um, you can also offer seeds off of our website or through our beanstalkseeds.com website. But look on our website, it'll tell you about that. Um, and then um, you can actually order them if you're not here in the Kansas City area and get them shipped anywhere in the country. Um, we have some very interesting seed varieties that we think are great for kids' gardens and grown up gardens, of course. Um, so check out our website. Um, but also you can come visit here at the Kansas City Community Gardens office. We're here located at 6917 Kensington in Scope Park. We're near the Nature Center and the Pet Project in the zoo. Uh, we have a special children's garden that you can come look at, opens up in June 1st. Uh, but we will be selling tomato plants and pepper plants coming up. It's a big deal. Everyone's excited about getting tomato plants. 
in order to buy plants, you need to become a member. You can do that on the day of, if you want to come during the, the special sale days. It's this Thursday and Friday this week. On Thursday, it's for green card members only. And then on Friday, it's for any color card, green, yellow, or blue card members. Or if you're a new member, that would be the day to come that day. And we'll have lots of great tomatoes and peppers and eggplant for sale. Um, but those aren't the only days we will be having those plants. Uh, those are just the first two days we'll be selling them. So a lot of people are anxious, uh, but we have over right now, 50, 60,000 peppers, tomatoes, and eggplants that are growing in our greenhouse. So we'll have plenty, we hope. Um, so Jennifer, can you tell me if there are any questions? We have had two so far. The first question was about how you would go about trapping squash bugs. Okay, yep. Um, one way to do that is, um, it sounds kind of uh, primitive, but what people will do is they'll put like a wooden board out in the soil next to your squash plants. So think of something like a, a one by six, one by eight, a flat board, could even be a, a long piece of plywood or something like that. And you lay it down on the ground where the squash plants are next to them. And in the cool of the evening, or actually they, they will come out when it's cool, um, in the heat of the day, um, they'll, they'll, sometimes they'll go underneath those, those boards and you can go out there and flip the board over and you'll see them, and then you can step on them and squash them. Um, so you're not actually trapping them, but that's where they'll congregate. So that's pretty effective. Um, again, the other thing is trying to get those little nymphs that have just hatched out. You can either squash them with your, your, your finger, um, or you can spray them at that stage um, with an organic spray, and they're pretty easy to control. But once they get to be the adults, they're harder to kill. Uh, with sprays, so you have to literally step on them to squash them. Uh, but that's not why they're called squash bugs. They're called squash bugs because they like to eat your squash plants. Okay, next question. Next question is, how well does the Three Sisters interplanting of corn, beans, and squash work? And would a watermelon work instead of squash? Okay, yeah, so what that question is referring to, it's a Native American um, planting technique, which was used for many, many years, and people still use it, where you plant corn and it's growing up tall as corn does. And then um, on the ground, underneath the corn, you're planting squash because it's running and spreading out. So it's filling up the space in between the corn plants. And then you also plant some beans. Once that corn stalk starts to grow, you can plant some pole beans that will climb up that corn stalk. And, you know, <coughs> that'll be your little trellis for holding your climbing beans. And some people like this just because it's interplanting. Um, it can work. Um, but the thing is, what most people don't realize when they were doing the corn that way, they weren't necessarily planting uh, rows of corn because that rows of corn would shade out anything for your squash below that. Uh, they would be planting like a hill of corn where you plant like five plants together in a hill and then maybe skip two or three feet and plant another hill and do it there and then skip another two or three feet and plant another hill. And that would allow space in between for the squash to grow underneath. Um, and then, you know, the beans, you know, if you're planting your corn too close together, again, the beans would not get enough sun. So you have to space your corn out and not have your corn planted as densely. Um, the watermelon probably would not work as well because they definitely need full sunshine and the corn would tend to shade it out and you would not get good fruit production. Um, but, you know, with some winter squash, um, some pole beans and some corn, you could try that. Um, it's definitely kind of fun to do and see how it works. Uh, but for me, I would probably just choose to plant them individually. So, 
if people have more questions, you can email us at contact at kccg.org and we can answer questions for you. And we'll also have people around at our office when you come in to get seeds and plants who can answer questions for you as well. So, and there's lots of great resources on our website, uh, planting calendars, planting information, all kinds of things that can help you uh, navigate your garden for this year. So, anything else, Jennifer? Just one last follow-up question on the three sisters planting. Yep. Would it work if you plant them in blocks, for instance, four per square foot? Yeah, I could see planting it in blocks. Um, you just can't put the corn this close together, you know? So you, again, you'd have to have some space in between your little blocks of corn. Um, but yeah, no, that would definitely work. That's it for the chat. No more questions. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Check our website for future workshops, and we'll look forward to seeing you sometime out at the Kansas City Community Gardens.